more questions than we had last night, which is good. <laughs> Here we go. They had, how time, do you, they had time to think. <laughs> how do you close the deal after you present the gospel? Do you pray a prayer, let them go? What exactly? All right. Um, that was the video I was looking for, um, and I couldn't find it for some reason. All right. You, you keep looking but, through that. So, yeah. Oh. Are you close? I don't know. You know what? I could do it with this. Uh, I probably have the software up still. No, I don't. Okay. So basically, I'll just answer. Um, okay. So let me. There's another question, a, a tie-in. So let me give you both okay. questions. So there's that one, and then second. Oh, so you're you, ac you actually read these this time, and you're going to tie them together. I read them last Not time. Not ask the same didn't. question. Yeah. Are you going to take us through the complete process? You've done the good person, bad person test. They have established that they have violated God's perfect standard. What after that? Yeah. So. So basically what, I mean, I, I'm, the, the message of the gospel is that Jesus Christ, God Almighty, left heaven, came to earth to pay for the, the punishment that we owe. Now, why Jesus Christ? What makes him so unique? And this is a thing people don't think through. If, when we explain the gospel, what we want to explain is that because we have violated God's law, even if we lied once, all liars have their place in the lake of fire. We want them to understand this is an eternal consequence because God is infinitely holy, infinitely just, and therefore he's going to punish. And it's going to have an infinite consequence, not because of us and what we did, but who we offended. Okay, if you ever want an illustration of this, and by the way, if you, what I could encourage you to do is if you go to Striving for Eternity, there is a link uh, to the most important message you could ever hear. I encourage you to listen just because it is, it is how I, I would fully present the gospel to someone because that's basically what it is. But what I will often do with folks is when I go through this, I'll give the illustration. If, if, if you were to threaten my life, police would tell you to stay away from me. Okay? If you threaten Donald Trump's life, what's going to happen? Yeah, you're going to go to prison for at least 48 hours till they can find some other charges, right? Okay, well, maybe not in Trump, but if it was Obama. Um, <laughs> Trump, maybe they'd encourage it. Uh, hey, look, you, you, you guys, you know, I know you're conservative out here. You guys actually have freedom. I mean, I, we don't have that in Jersey. So, so, you know, the thing is, there's a difference in the consequence, not because of the threat, but because who was threatened, I usually jokingly, use, I use Obama because I can, I can always jokingly say, you know, don't let Barack Obama know this, but God is infinitely more important than him. Okay? And so it's, it's who was offended. And so because of that, that brings the consequence, an eternal consequence. That eternal consequence, for me to pay a fine for eternity, takes how long? Forever. Right? So if I never broke the law, guess what? I can only pay it for one person. And I always say, I wouldn't pay it for you, it would be for my wife, right? The reality is, is none of us if, if, can have a temporal being pay an eternal fine. This is what makes Christ unique. Being fully God, he can pay an eternal fine and pay it for more than one person. So being fully God, he can pay that fine. Being fully man, he had to live under the law, not breaking any of the law, so that he could be the proper sacrifice. And that's why he is unique, because he's fully God, fully man, and can pay the fine. I'll also get into the fact that we can't be saved by works. That's by faith alone. Now, the thing is, is what's the proof of all this? The proof is that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose himself from the dead as he predicted he would. That's where, I, at that point, do I pray with them? Maybe. What I'll tell them to do is, I do not tell people, by the way, that they have to repent of their sins, plural. I tell them they have to repent of their sin. Okay? I do, I'm not going to tell someone you can't be saved by works, and then you have to turn from your bad works and do good works. That's what sins are, right? Bad works. It's a turning from the pride, turning from thinking I'm a good person or that my good works will merit salvation. John, 12, uh, John 1, 12, and 13, 
Um, and so I don't misquote it. I know I'm going to, you said there's more. All right. So I just don't want to misquote this. But John 1, uh, 12, by the way, this is a great one to use with Mormons because they say we're all children of God. But John 1, 12 disagrees with that. But to all who receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now watch this. Who were born not of blood, nor the will of man of flesh, nor the will of man, but God. There's three things that are not. It's not of it's not of your genealogy, like I thought my Judaism. It's not by your your works, and it's not by your just your desire. It's God who saves. And so what I'll tell people is that they have to turn from trusting themselves as a good person, their genealogy, or the fact that they just desire heaven. The works aren't going to save them. They need to turn and trust in Christ and Christ alone. If I pray with them, and the clip that I want to show you, I may pull it up during lunch, uh, is me with a man at the Super Bowl who recognizes his sin, wants to repent. What I do is I, I will say, you pray, and I will pray after you. I never lead anyone in a prayer. There should, if they understand their sinfulness before holy God and God's grace in their life, there is no need to lead them in a prayer. Guys, did anyone need to lead you in asking your wife what to say and asking your wife to marry you? No, you knew what you wanted to say. I like how Ray Comfort says it. If, if, if someone commits adultery and, and they're, 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 the guy is going to go to someone else to tell him what to say to his wife, what's his wife going to think? Honey, I didn't, shouldn't have done that. Honey, I shouldn't have done that. I'll never do it again. I'll never do it again. Right? If someone understands the message, they understand they need to repent. The prayer doesn't save them. Okay? I, God saves them, and he often will do it long before the prayer. So I will pray that God does do a work in their heart after, after they pray. Uh, as far as follow-up, which often comes up in this, uh, if you're doing it, if, and, and I strongly, strongly encourage you guys to, to form an evangelism team here at the church, the follow-up would be getting a contact information and going, visiting them. And you can invite them to church, but inviting someone to church is not evangelism. Inviting them to church is discipleship. You go and make disciples. The first part of it is evangelism. You go out. You, when they get saved, they come in. They don't come in to hear the gospel. Are you saying that churches are not for evangelism? The church yes. service? Good. I, I, in my church, there was a sign on the back door that said, entering the mission field. We go out to share the gospel. When they get saved, we bring them in for discipleship. All right. We've got to be quicker with this next one. Describe how you recognize the role of the Holy Spirit in giving gospel encounters or driving gospel encounters during gospel encounters. Sorry. It's not my reading. It's the writing. That is, you've described these so far as if they're human efforts. Well, I just, I just wait to hear that small whisper from the Lord. And uh, Good, Justin was smiling. Uh, I got nervous with that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there's things, you know, like I'll go back to what Chad said. I mean, when Chad said to that guy, like, no gospel message for you, he was like, I, I, I mean, I was like, wow, that was really rude. <laughs> and he was like, I don't know why I said it. You know, um, I think there are times that the Holy Spirit can prompt us to say or do something that we, you know, but I'm not going to get all mystical on it. You know, was that the Holy Spirit? There's no scripture that says it was, so I'm not going to say it was. Um, I'm not, I, I, so I'm really, <laughs> I don't say something is of the Lord unless scripture says it's of the Lord. So I'm kind of really, you know, I don't, even if it looks like it could be, I, I'm not going to say it. And many times it would be just like sometimes preaching in a church or teaching a Bible lesson. You really have, from this side of the pulpit, you have no way of knowing whether the Holy Spirit is involved in this or not. You're trusting He is. You're asking that He be. You've worked and labored that that might be the case. But then when you stand up to preach, there's no light that comes on the pulpit that lets me know, oh, the Holy Spirit's at work in someone's life now. Just, you're, you're, you're using human effort and human labor, trusting that God's going to use the results wait, of that. Wait, wait. You, you haven't seen the glitter <laughs> that falls? Oh. I tell my daughter that practicing homosexuality is a sin according to Scripture. She tells me it's only my interpretation. How do I respond to that? 
as she has family members on her husband's sides who are gay. Um, usually what I do is I just open to the passages that deal with homosexuality and let them read it. And then I say, it's not my, you know, what, is, what does that say? And they're either going to do some hermeneutical gymnastics or they're going to say really intelligent things like, I know what that says, but it doesn't mean what it says. Something like that. I mean, they read it and they realize what it's saying. The words are clear. They just don't like it. Or they'll say, well, that was a different cultural time. Where did God say the change occurred? Um, I understand that this is an issue that in our culture is a hot-button issue. Um, and I think that um, I know very well, <laughs> uh, as I just did a message on how to witness to homosexuals and, and the kind, and one of the largest atheist blog sites now has an article saying that I claim all homosexuals are pedophiles. I've been getting lots of very interesting uh, messages and emails and phone calls and uh, Twitters. It's been a wonderful couple of weeks. Uh, they are they're very aggressive, but they're very intolerant. And so when what I will do in a lot of times in that case is say, when, when they try to re-justify and say, well, that's just that culture, things have changed. You know, I will often ask, do you think that my position is wrong for trusting what the Bible says? When they say yes... I explain that that's intolerant. If they're going to be tolerant, they have to accept what the Bible says. They don't have to agree with it. I mean, God also says lying is wrong, but people still lie. doesn't mean that we don't love them when we say your lying is a sin. What do you do when someone has actually killed someone and you are actually scared? <laughs> well, I told you, I try to find a way to make light of it. I mean, I do. I, humor does help me with that. It, it, it does help. Um, you know, let me let me tell you uh, let me tell you a quick story about someone else. Uh, Kirk Cameron was sharing the gospel with some gangbangers, uh, and there's a video on it. I forget what it's called. It might be Kirk Cameron and gangbangers, actually. But you you can watch in that video that he's talking to one guy that seems receptive, and there is a guy right to his left that when he says if if you're even angry with someone, you've committed murder in your heart, and the guy turns gets right in Kirk's face. No, it doesn't say that. Kirk told me he was. Very nervous right then. He knew these were gangbangers, you know. And the one guy seemed reasonable, but he, this guy, and he had guys standing behind him. He said he got extremely nervous, and he was just praying, Lord, I'm going to trust in you. And he just kept sharing the gospel. Now, by the way, the guy who was standing right here that said, no, that's not what the scripture says, five years later, one of the guys that works at Living Waters, Scotty, where they were sitting out at Santa Monica, he saw a guy biting the inside of his lip, and he said, that's the gangbanger. He was holding a pro-life sign. He got saved. When do you determine when you are now casting pearls before swine and done witnessing? I have no idea. I really don't. That, that's like one of the hardest questions. Uh, I, in the early years, I tended to be like I would sit and spend as much time with someone as possible as long as they were still willing to sit and talk. And then I realized that sometimes that was a waste of time, and now sometimes I think I'm too much on the other side, where if I th think someone's wasting my time, I'm too quick to, to cut them off and move on. I don't know. There isn't like a, a good way to judge that sometimes. I think if they're just mocking, 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 then it's probably pearl, pearls before swine. But at the same time, um, I knew someone that was sharing the gospel at a gas station, and just the guy was mocking, and he thought he was tossing putting his pearls before swine, and um, the guy, you know, my friend Joe, just basically thought this is going to go nowhere. The very last act that this guy did, when Joe figured he was just going to say this one last thing and end the conversation, the guy got upset and took a swing at him. And Joe ducked under the punch. The guy actually swung completely around, did a 360, leaned back against the pole there, slid down, put his hands in his face, started bawling his eyes, and said, what must I do to be saved? So you never know. What gospel tracts do you find most effective? Um, so I get gospel tracts from many three places. Uh, Living Waters, Track Planet, and One Million Tracks. So trackplanet.com and one million tracks.com or one million track.com, I forget if there's plural or not. 
Uh, both of those will customize your tracks. So you can have your own tracks. So I, have, I go to them a lot because I get my own tracks made. Um, I prefer tracks that are small enough to fit into a pocket. People are more likely to keep it. If you give the big pamphlets, you know, they're less likely to keep it. Living Waters makes a little booklet called Are You a Good Person? It's only about this big by that wide, and it's a little booklet you can read through, and people can just shove it in their pocket, and it has a good, clear message. Million-dollar bills are fun. Um, if, you, if you want, like if you're going around New York, a fun thing to do, we, we would do this. If a person takes a track, they're more likely to take more. The old million-dollar bills that Living Waters made didn't have a real clear message on it. So what we used to do is we were priming the pump. We would have one guy go about 10, 15 feet ahead of another, in front of other people, and he would hand out million-dollar bills, and anyone that took a million-dollar bill were more likely to take other tracks. So we used the million-dollar bills to kind of prime the pump for, <laughs> for taking more. I keep hearing how persecution is coming. In your decades of experience, are you seeing a definite change? Maybe a shift in the culture, a shift yeah. in attitude publicly? Yeah. Um, one of the things the atheists really don't like about me is I keep bringing up the Holocaust. Uh, when you're raised Jewish a generation after the Holocaust, you're raised to remember. Uh, we went through a lot of documentaries on the Holocaust, and the reason was so we would not forget. The things that always blew me away as a child is that throughout the Holocaust, all of Germany kept saying these things can't be happening because we're too civilized. Um, they were civilized, and it happened anyway. And I, I do believe there is another persecution coming, but I do not believe it will be the Jews this time. I believe it will be Christians. You have a violent atheism and a radical Islam, both targeting the same group. It's amazing to me that atheists are willing to support and defend and work with Muslims, and the Muslims are willing to support and defend atheism and homosexuality. Blows, excuse me, blows me away. But they have a common enemy, the truth. And they need to, you know, for them to, to radically restructure America as the liberals want to do, they must get rid of absolute truth. And we're the ones that are left proclaiming it. And so, yes, I believe that, uh, you know, as soon as, as soon as any kind of persecution begins, um, I think that Joel Steen will be out of a job. Um, his nice smile won't do it anymore. But the reality is, is yeah, I think it's coming. And I think that the, the genuine Christians who want to study and God's Word and love God will stand strong. And I think that uh, we, we should prepare. And the, the best way to prepare really is to know the Word of God and proclaim the gospel. Because the fact that we might see all the signs of a persecution coming does not mean that God cannot bring another revival. He's done it before. He can do it again. But it starts with one. It starts with us. It doesn't start with someone else. Revival always starts with us and spreads to other people who it starts with us, right? So I, I think a lot of people get uh, you know, down in the mouth because they're thinking, oh, this is, I don't want to live in, under persecution. Um, America's had 200 plus years of not being, having Christian persecution, longest in history. Um, but I think it's coming, but I could be wrong, you know? God can cause a revival that radically changes this country and even the world if he wants to. Uh, but we we got to be sharing the gospel, not fighting it politically. I, I, I'll get on a different hobby horse. Do you have time for this hobby horse? Yeah. Look at that. Well, we can always do another Q&A. <laughs> uh, basically, here's the thing. The problem, I think, is that there's too many Christians that understand the Republican message and not the gospel message. And the reason people are seeing the problems they see as the ills of our culture are because they're so focused on th seeing Trump be the solution to the problem. The man doesn't know the gospel. How is he going to be the solution? That was a quick hobby horse. It was. It was good. How do you respond to someone who refused to accept the barbaric God of the Old Testament who killed babies and animals, etc.? Oh, I make them define that. See, they, often what they do is, you know, they'll, they'll bring up things like Canaan. I mean, I mean, all of Canaan had to be wiped out. Even the animals and children. Yeah. Why the animals? Oh, that's right, because one of the things with Canaan, what they were doing was they were, they were very into bestiality, and you can't change a beast once it gets used to doing that. They would have their young children 
as young as two and three from what we see with records doing things with adults. That, that will totally screw a culture up. We're, we're living it now. All right, so, so the thing is that here's the simple question. Would God have been just in wiping out Adam and Eve the moment they sinned? Yes. The question is not how is God barbaric or unjust. The question is why in the world is he so long-suffering? Do you share the gospel with Muslims differently? There's a sentiment circulating that they respond best to love. Well, I try to show love to everybody. So, um, you know, I try to go out of my way to show love so that I'm not the offense. Uh, I will show, share the gospel differently to Muslims than to a Mormon than to a Jehovah's Witness only because I'm familiar with their doctrines. So I can approach it very differently. I can, I can speak to the level of what, they, what their system believes. Not everyone knows enough about them, though if you get my book, you get which you have. <laughs> so, but the thing is, is that I, I, I will, but the, the, the message of the gospel doesn't change for them. Do you show love? Yeah, you show love to everybody, even the atheist, even the person yelling at you. Do you have more than one suit jacket because you wore that one last night? <laughs> yeah, I'll have it tomorrow. Uh, my bags were 70 pounds, so I had to choose what I was wearing. How do you deal with people who think heaven won't be enjoyable? I mean, I would take one of your suit jackets, but I don't know if I'd... Right. It would... <laughs> how, do you deal, how, do you deal, how do you deal with people who think heaven won't be enjoyable? Uh, to an unbeliever, heaven wouldn't be enjoyable. I agree. I mean, when people tell me they want to go to heaven, but they, they don't believe in God or they don't like God or they, they, don't need, they don't think they need to obey God, why would heaven be enjoyable? So you want to go to a place where all you're going to be doing is worshiping someone you don't love? No. They, they want to go to hell. How do you deal with someone who prefers science over the Bible because science is more interesting? Uh, there's no conflict there. It, it's, only, it's only the atheists that try to say that these are two mutually exclusive. Why did people used to do science? The original scientists that you end up seeing studied science because they wanted to know the world that God created. So you, you, they're not mutually exclusive. How do you reach someone who claims to have had a bad experience in church as a child and has closed the door on God? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. So most, like I said yesterday, most of the atheists I talk to, if, when they say they're atheists, I ask what church they grew up in. Uh, I, I think of one guy who told me that, uh, he told me at church, and I said, what happened there? Well, one of the deacons had raped his sister. That's difficult. Do not brush that off. Suddenly, I'm in a counseling situation as much as I am a gospel situation. Never make light of the sin that someone may do in a church. But I also will remind them, yes, the church is filled with people who are sinners. They're not, it's not hypocritical to say that, you know, that when people say, oh, I, it's so hypocritical, the church are filled with sinners. Yeah, that's kind of like the entry point into being the church. You admit you're a sinner. It is, the hypocrites are outside of the church where they think they're a good person when they're not. We say we're sinners, but forgiven. Not perfect, forgiven is a big distinction. Uh, you can't brush off the, what ended up happening to the person. Okay, Don't excuse it and don't make light of it. But the thing is, the gospel is the solution. Let me tell you one quick thing that happened. I had a young man uh, in New York who told me that he didn't believe in God because when he was younger, he had a, uh, he had a learning disability, and he prayed often in his Christian home that he was raised. He kept praying for God to take away this learning disability. He wanted to be like everyone else and not have the struggle he had. And as I was talking to him, I said, well, how did this work out? It turned out that he had to study harder than everyone else in school. He had to put more effort in when he got a job, he had to put more effort in than anyone else. This was the vice president of his company. I asked him, I said, let me ask you a question. If God took that away, would you have worked as hard in school? He says, I wouldn't have had to. I said, would you have worked as hard at your job? He said, I wouldn't have had to. Would you be the vice president if God took that away? And it dawned on him. Him having that learning disability forced him to work harder than anyone else, and it got him to raise the position he was at. Suddenly, what he thought was a curse ended up being a blessing. And what he said, that God can't exist because he didn't answer me. And I said, well, listen, no offense, but you're not God. God doesn't submit to you. We submit to him. 
Here's a man who ended up taking it and realizing that, you know what? God could have had a purpose in this. Our sharing of the gospel is based on Scripture. What is your response when they don't believe it as to be the inerrant word of God? Usually I say, well, either you're right or God's right. I'm going to believe God. He's never lied. Okay. <laughs> I mean, what, what you could do is just say, I mean, they say, well, I don't believe that. That's okay. God doesn't believe you. It, it's an epistemology issue. How do we yeah. know what is right? How do we know what is true? In what way should you address someone whose conscience is so seared that they believe themselves justified to be, and to be applauded for being good at breaking the moral law? Uh, typically, I just walk away. So that's when you cast pearls before yeah. someone. I mean, I, or not cast pearls before someone. You know, I, I have Solomon Siegel in New York. Um, he's been listening to me for almost a dozen years now. Uh, he just makes mockery of it, makes light of it. He even makes his own gospel tracks now. He's got his own stickers. He's creating his own religion, okay? Um, it's just, you know, I, I don't even share the gospel with him. I just, he's heard it over and over. I greet him when I get to the park. I use him to help me get a crowd. Um, but I don't, I, I, I haven't actually shared the gospel with him probably in several years. And some of you may say, think that's wrong. He's heard it over and over and over, week after week, week in, week out. But... The fact that he keeps coming out, uh, I was going to tell a story later, but uh, here's the thing. Solomon Siegel, I was on my preaching box. Solomon was over here. He got sucker punched. Okay, someone just punched him. I watched his Bluetooth earpiece fly in front of me. I didn't think. I just reacted. I jumped off my box right in front of Solomon to protect him from his his attacker. Solomon is vile. Okay, he, he does everything he can to get Christians disgusted and upset. I jumped right in front of him. I jumped so quick that his attacker actually fell backwards because he didn't expect someone to move that quick. Solomon told his friends later he's never seen anyone move that quick. Okay, He was surprised that me, someone who he has been heckling for years and giving a hard time for years, would jump to protect him. That radically changed the relationship with Solomon. Solomon is, is very different around me now. Solomon one day, the, if you guys remember when Harold Camping said that the world was going to come to an end, one of the many times he said it, one of those times Solomon brought a huge cross to Union Square. He got up on his thing and he, he stood there like this. And he, he was saying that he was being hung there and he had a perverted sign about Christ, uh, referring to Christ in a perverted way. I was able to, because of the years of, of working there and, and going to the same place, I walked up to Solomon, I pulled him aside alone, and I said, I don't want to, I, if you have any respect for me, you will never do that again. He's like, it's just funny. I said, no, it's not funny. You're making a mockery of someone I love dearly, and I will not stand for it. He's like, well, I don't believe Jesus is It doesn't matter what you believe. If you have any respect for me, you will never do that again. And he turned and said, I'm sorry, Andrew. I'll never do it again. Now, I continue to share. He's softened toward us, but he's still hard-hearted to the gospel that he's heard over and over. I don't keep sharing it with him, but I keep showing love to him. If there's opportunity for me to sit down over a meal with him, I'll do that. There's a, something that changed in his life, and we're, many of us are praying. He just had a baby with his girlfriend. He's behaving differently now. We're hoping that that softens his heart. There, there are literally hundreds of people around the country uh, that pray for Solomon Siegel because he's, people come to New York and, and know him. And the day he gets saved, I, I think maybe one day he will, there's going to be so much rejoicing around the country. When it comes to astute atheists, what do you say to the critique accusing the lie told by Rahab concerning the spies, the Jewish midwives concerning the male Jews born in Egypt? When it's... I'm assuming that the, the critique would mean that... Um, that it's okay to lie or something? Yeah, the, 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 well, you, you're saying that lying is a sin, and you, yeah. you have Rahab, and you have the... Yeah, Rahab was wrong. ...the Jewish midwives. I know it shocks people. Like, wait, Rahab's mentioned in the, the Hall of Faith, Hebrews 11. So were a lot of other sinners. Nowhere is Rahab praised for her lie. She's praised for her faith in Christ being a Gentile that puts so much faith in the Jewish God that she's willing to to turn away from her entire people, her family and everyone else, to believe in that God. She's praised for her faith, not her lie. 
When, uh, how can you overcome the fear of being a hypocrite when witnessing to somebody who knew you before you were saved? Well, okay. Part of that is I don't have any friends left that are, <laughs> that are from my saved days. <laughs> um, but the reality is I, I, I'm not, I, I can't avoid the, the whole argument of hypocrite because of the fact that I always, one of the things I always tell people when I go through the law is I say, you may be a far more moral person than me, but it's not our morality that gets us right with God. I will always raise them up as being more moral than me. I will always put myself down. By the way, a side note of that, where that benefits is that people always tell me how humble I am because I make fun of myself and I put myself down and I raise them up because our culture doesn't do that. Our culture raises self up and they think I'm humble. They're so deceived. It's not humility. Huh? It's not humility. I know you're very proud of your humility. Yeah, I am. Okay. <laughs> what is a clear way to explain to someone that God is good when they don't want to believe in bad or evil? They deny those moral categories. How do you get them to affirm those moral yeah. categories? I, I did, and this is hard with our culture. I had a, a, a lady who, she's on college campuses evangelizing, and she asked me this question. How do you get people to realize there, are, there is absolute right and wrong? I said, take their wallet. Ask if, they, if you could see their wallet. When they give it to you, take it and walk off. She called me up and says, they don't stop me. I'm like, then you're just not walking far enough. <laughs> you have it on video, right? They gave it to you. They can't say they stole it. Uh, you know... <laughs> So, so the next generation, I don't know if that works anymore, uh, but there are absolutes. Look, I always ask, this is the question that I like to ask to, to address the issue of an absolute morality. Is it always, is rape, the act of rape, always wrong? So I'm not saying rape, the act of rape. Is the act of rape always wrong? If it's always wrong, it's universal. Okay? And they always say yes. And they, why is it wrong? And they don't always think about the why, because here's the thing. There was a dentist in New Jersey that put several women to sleep and committed that act while they were asleep. They had no harm done to them. They, they didn't have, the, 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 the fact is that they, some of the women didn't know it occurred. After it was known and it became known and he ended up confessing, the women that didn't even know that they had been raped suddenly started to suffer the, the, the effects of being raped. So I say to them, so the act itself isn't the problem. It's knowing that you are. So you just should have kept quiet. And they want, well, no, it's about consent. Because originally they will always say harm. Now they shift to consent. Well, how do you know that they wouldn't have consented? I mean, they were just sleeping. You see, if it's about consent, then it's not about the act. It's about the consent. The question is, is the act itself always wrong? But there's nothing in their worldview that can say it is. Now, I'm going to say it's always wrong. But I'm going to say it's always wrong because God's not a rapist. Because we get our morality from the nature of God. They have no way to say that it's always universally wrong. Because there's a way to explain away the harm. And if they say it's about consent, then that's not about the act. So what you're doing is pushing moral buttons. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and, and, and the reason for taking the issue of rape is because everyone's going to say it's wrong. You know, now you do get some people that say, well, maybe in some societies it's okay. Now you're dealing with an unreasonable person. So, you know, when they get to that point, they're just looking for anything. And sometimes I'll say, you're just looking for anything to get around this. I said to one person, are you just making this up as you go along? He went, well, yeah, kind of. How can I start the conversation again with a family member who feels like I judged them in sharing the gospel when as a new Christian I probably did? Apologize. Ask forgiveness. Uh, just, I mean, especially if you think you did, just say, you know what, you know, th this is something really important to me that I want to share with you, but, you know, first, my first attempt, I think I was wrong in the way I did this. So first off, I'd like to ask if you'd forgive me. Okay, and then, you know, see if they, they, will. they may not let you at first, but keep seeking ways to show love and show the, share the gospel. The last session you do is called Handling Objections. Here's the question. Tell me if you want to defer this till the last session. What is or are the most often asked questions or objections you get? Yeah, when we, since you have a stack still, we'll, we'll handle that after. Okay. Because I'm going to go through most of them. Someone admits they're a sinner, but what do you say when someone will not accept that Christ died for sinners? God disagrees with you. <laughs> I mean, look, I have, I have two presuppositions I hold to. I don't change. God exists. He has spoken. 
So I don't have to, you know, when they, when they say, when I give them scripture and they disagree with it, well, one of us, one of you is wrong, either God or you, which one? Right? I'm always, I'm, you know, it's, it's amazing to watch because you just say, well, God disagrees with you. You know, I had one person that said, well, I'm an atheist. I said, well, God doesn't agree with you. God doesn't believe in atheists. And I read Romans 1. One, one of you created the entire universe. I'll trust him. Do you think everyone should open air share the gospel? No, I do not. Uh, years, years ago, I used to try to get lots of people to do open air. I do not. Um, I've seen a problem with open air evangelism. It's actually kind of funny. In the book, Sharing the Good News of Mormons, I have a chapter on open air evangelism, and the publisher was very upset with me. Uh, this was supposed to be this practical lesson on how to do open air. And they said half of your 6,000 words are explaining who should not do open air. <laughs> this is supposed to be encouraging people to do it. They wanted me to change it. I said, I refuse. I said, the problem is, is that anyone that gets encouraged to do open air is going to go to YouTube and see thousands of ways not to do it. They're going to see prideful people who are arrogant, talking down to people, judging them, and giving a bad name to Christianity. And so I want to be very clear that, no, there are some people who should not be doing it. The first thing I always tell people when people have me come in to do an evangelism training specifically in open air is I say that you should never have someone who struggles with pride, where it's clearly a struggle for them, doing open air. Too many people think when they're on the streets that that's a pulpit and they're a pastor. There are people, there, there are people who would never be allowed to teach in a church or be behind a pulpit that go to the streets because they think they can get a crowd. There's plenty of people who like to debate or like to get the attaboys from their friends, the pats on their back, for slamming and nailing some atheist. We're not out there to silence them just for the sake of winning a debate. We use the apologetics to silence them to share the gospel. But there's way too many people that just want to feel better about themselves and nailing someone. And by the way, when you have people that are sitting there and you're talking about hell and someone's going to hell and then they get down from the box and then they're joking with their buddies about what they just said to the guy. Yeah, people are still watching. If your heart is not broken for that person who is headed to hell, then don't get up on the box. As a follow-up to that, you've worked with Ray Comfort. You have your own teams that you've done. Guys that Striving for Eternity has has trained to do open-air preaching, open-air evangelism. When you go out into the street, New York, the Super Bowl, you see other guys who are doing that. Of the guys that you know, or of the guys that you do not know what their affiliation is, in other words, you know that they're not Ray Comfort, they're not your guys, what percentage of them do it right, do it well? One? Half? <laughs> One half of a percent? Maybe. I mean, seriously, I don't, I, when you, I go, you see a lot of, you I see, see a lot, lot of bad. garbage. Yeah, I see a lot of, bad, and, and it gets all, I mean, when I, when I, when I get introduced and people say that, I, you know, I'm an open air evangelist or street preacher or something like that, I usually will say, yes, I'm a street preacher. And whatever you're thinking of that, I'm not that. Because it doesn't, it almost doesn't matter. It's so, it's so filled. I mean, there, there is, the worst of them are the Pelagians. I mean, the real Pelagians, not just the Calvinist calling someone a Pelagian, if you understand those terms. But these are guys that think they're sinlessly perfect. And they sit up there, and, and a woman will come by and ask a question, and literally these guys will be like, you, should, you don't even have the right to speak. You should be in a kitchen somewhere. They will say that from a, pulp, from a, a box. I, Jeff, I... So, I've, let me repeat the question. What do you think of Jeff yeah, Durbin? What do you think of Jeff Durbin? So, Je Jeff, I've... Um, I don't know Jeff well. We've exchanged messages every once in a while. Um, I actually invited him to be one of the guys uh, for the book on Mormonism because he does a lot with Mormons. Um, <clears throat> the little that I've seen of him has been great. Uh, he seems to really, because, the, and, and I'm, I don't, I don't, I'm saying it because I just don't have a wealth of, I, I haven't followed him and, and all this stuff. But what I have seen, he does it very well. What you see with Jeff is what you'll see with Ray, the compassion. There's no question that he cares for the person he's speaking to. He's not doing it for the, his buddies who are with him. He's not doing it to win an argument. He's doing it because he cares for the person. 
So you, you're out on the street with your guys. You see the guys who are doing it poorly. Have you ever had interactions or conversations with the guys that yeah. are doing it poorly? I, I try not to uh, because, again, I may know the differences, but others who are there may not. Uh, the biggest struggle I, I, I've had with those guys is they come up and their whole issue is they'll come up and go, do you read only from the King James Bible? And it becomes, it becomes a conflict. Now, I can understand the issues of King James onlyism. They understand that. But you know what? All the, the non-believers don't see what it is. They just see Christians fighting. Okay, so I, want, I, I, I will deal with that separately if at all possible. Uh, typically, I just try to avoid them altogether because they're just unreasonable. Concerning the atheists, when you ask individuals about why they left a church, what is the reason the majority of them give? Well, a majority of them, it's because of what they think is legalism or hypocrisy from their parents. That, that's the number one reason. Or it's going to be something that happened in a church. Uh, you know, either, like I gave you the one case, but I, I know others who had their, their you know, father or mother treated poorly. Uh, you know, there's one who, who her you know, mother was a single mother. Church just didn't care for her, didn't really take care of her. And, and they blame the whole church everywhere for what one church does. And it's important to note that, you know what, there's a lot of people that do things in the name of Christ because they're not Christian. You know, and you don't blame, you don't, you don't, you don't dis, disregard the truth because of what one person who doesn't actually follow the truth is. And then they're going to tell you, that, oh, so it's no true Scotsman fallacy. Okay. The, the new true, no true Scotsman fallacy is the fact that like one person will say, well, no Scotsman would do this. And when that's done, well, no true Scotsman would do this. So, it's, so we're saying that no true Christian would do this. Well, it could be a true Christian could do something you know, mean to another person. It happens. But the thing is that's, that doesn't dis, disvalue what Christianity is and what Christianity teaches. If they did it, they were in sin. Right? I, I, didn't, I don't excuse Rahab's sin. It was a sin. Could she? Could Rahab have have spared the lives of the of the spies without lying? I would say yes. Okay. When it comes to biblical ethics, uh, I am what's called a non-conforming absolutist. It means that I believe there is always a way in every situation to not sin. We just don't always do it. Okay, there seems to be a danger of growing arrogant in our knowledge of God and forgetting that we too are lost and blind. How do you maintain humility, assuming you ever achieve it, and a loving compassion toward the lost without getting frustrated? Well, see, I never achieve it, so I don't have to worry. Um, no, you know, that's the reason I try to always disciple uh, new believers, because it helps me remember where they're at. I, I remember, I got this burned into my brain early on. We had a guy that was saved about three weeks, and so he came to church. And he finished up a cigarette while he was outside the church door before he came in because he knew smoking in church probably wouldn't be good. And we sat there, and this guy came in and sits down. And I, I remember this guy, Danny, who was sitting right behind him. And we're sitting there, and the pastor asked to open to the Bible, and this guy is like this. He can't find it. Danny got so frustrated, Danny took his Bible grabs the guy's Bible, says, here, learn your way around a Bible, and you should stop smoking too. Danny forgot what it was like when he was first a believer. I said to Danny, I said, Danny, let me ask you a question. What were you like when you first got saved? <laughs> and, and he was explaining how rotten he was and all the things he did wrong that he had to learn. I said, do you think he might be in that same stage? So working with, with newer believers... Um, I work with a guy in my church who is, uh, he's mentally handicapped. I love working with him. He's like a sponge. He'll, he'll try to absorb as much as he can, but he's just out there. I mean, he'll say the most bizarre things. You know, I mean, we're sitting there talking about, you know, we're talking about the doctrine of imputation, and he's talking about a Japanese war based off some video game he played. And you're just like, where do you go with this? But this is where he's at. He's trying in, his, in the, his, the best of his ability, he's trying to understand the lessons. He's trying to relate it to what he can understand. I love working with him because of the fact that it reminds me where I went. I was, there was a time I was clueless about what Christianity taught. I never grew up reading the New Testament. I had to learn everything. And you know what? When I first started learning it, 
I trusted all the faith healers and, and the, because that's what I got exposed to. And I was trusting all these hyper charismatics and everything else. And I thought, they, well, they're Christians, so they know better than me. And I ended up realizing, no, they didn't. And so the thing that I guess works for me is to, to always be discipling people, to always be evangelizing, because I realize I, I just have to keep reminding myself over and over, I was once that person. I mean, yeah, I've learned a lot since then, but I was once that person. What is the best tactic for approaching the subject of adultery with someone who is a professing Christian but continues to commit it anyways, knowing it is wrong? Um, well, I'd follow through first with the uh, with that process of reconciliation card we have in the back um, because there are steps we, have, we should follow. We should check our own heart. Is adultery a sin? Yes. Uh, how do we approach it is something different. A lot of times people, especially if they're close to the situation, might have some, way too much emotion in it to be the right person to, to speak to it. Um, but the adultery um, issue is a clear sin, but there's sometimes our heart is not right. So before we even, I even say to approach the person, we first have to check our own heart and make sure that the reason we're approaching is because God's offended, not because I'm offended. How to approach it? Well, I would approach it one-on-one. What we see in Matthew 18 is that you, with any sin, you want to keep it as private as possible. Okay, so I wouldn't go sharing it with other people if I know about it. I would go directly to the two people involved that are committing the adultery. I'd go to them alone. Uh, if that doesn't work, I would get two witnesses. Now, what I would do with the witnesses, I would not go, hey, Jim, come with me. we got to go talk to so-and-so because they're committing adultery. Why? Because it could be that I'm wrong. Maybe I misunderstood something. Maybe my facts are wrong. Jim is going to be a witness to the unrepentance of someone that knows they're wrong and is committing it anyway. Maybe he's going to say, uh, Andrew, you're, you're wrong on this one. You're looking into it. You're seeing something that's just not there. So you never bring witnesses in that you've prejudged. Okay? If they agree that there's a sin here, it's still not being repented of. You bring it to the church, and the church goes. Now, that's the missing step. Many people just jump to, well, we excommunicate them. We put them out of the church. No. The next step is that the church, everybody in the church as one body, goes in a loving way to try to restore these two people and bring them back to repentance. If that doesn't work, then you have to put them out of the church, and you treat them as an unbeliever, and you share the gospel with them. You don't treat them like an like an unbeliever and say that they're, they're, you'd never talk to them again. No, you treat them like an unbeliever. It means you share the gospel with them because if they went through that far, they're probably not a believer. How do you shortcut or bypass postmodern truth arguments? Are they time wasters? They seem to be ineffective discussions that take lots of time and go nowhere. So are you saying that we got through all of the questions that in is time? Uh -huh. With eight minutes to spare. Uh -huh. you, you didn't think I'd do it? Uh -huh. No, I did not. I got eight minutes to answer that one. I no, you have, my time. I, you have two minutes because I have to pray and we have to get ready. <laughs> Looking at me, eating up my time. So, so um, yeah, postmodernism is this whole thing that nothing's, everything's relative, there are no absolutes. It is difficult because they're just squirmy. They're just all over the place. The millennial generation, for the most part, you know, not you guys. <laughs> but, no, I mean, for the most part, millennials are just like, it, it, they feel entitled to everything. Just because they think something, they think it's true. Um, and it, it becomes very hard to, to talk with folks like that. And so with, with folks like that, the thing is, is that you, you need to help them realize there are absolutes. They're going to sit there and say something is wrong. And what I'm going to usually do is, how can you say that? By, based on what standard? If they're going to say that there's a, there's a right and a wrong, what's the standard of that? There's only one absolute universal standard, God. They want to say society. Well, it's what society agrees with. Really? So was Hitler right? I mean, his society said it was okay to kill 11 million people. I've had some people say, well, yeah, sure, as long as that's the majority. I said the 11 million don't agree. So who gets to make the decision? They'll, they'll, well, who's ever in power? Oh, so then why, do you, why are you trying to change the laws of this country? Why do you want to see abor why would you want to see like, things like abortion legalized and homosexuality 
acceptable. You want to change something, you should just accept the way the things are. It's, that's what the majority if, the majority, if the argument is the majority of this country is Christian and they don't want abortion, then we should just say abortion is not legal, right? Why are you trying to change that? They, it presents them with a real problem because their worldview doesn't match what they're arguing for. Uh, and the reality is what they ultimately argue is might makes right. That's ultimately where they come down, is that who's ever in charge gets the right. And when they say that, I then always go to the issue of rape because it's just so absurd. And I say, so you would argue then that rape is okay. Whoever is stronger wins. If the guy is stronger, then rape occurs. If the woman's stronger, it doesn't happen. So might makes right. They'll never agree to that, ever, which is good. You shouldn't. But it shows the problems in their arguments. And so it goes back to where do you get your authority? Where do you get your morality? What is the source of this? Are they time wasters, the situations? Uh, they could be. Uh, but I think with the millennial generation, it, I wouldn't say they're time wasters. They're absolutely clueless. I, mean, I just see it time and time again. They, they just do not know how to think themselves out of a wet paper bag. I mean, seriously, I was involved in Occupy Wall Street, and I had a girl, she came up from Florida to, to be part of Occupy Wall Street. She was on her spring break. And she's there, and I'm talking to her, trying to reason with her. And she's saying, well, it's just not fair that some people have so much there are people who, they, they should be giving away. They shouldn't be keeping all of this. They should just give things away to people. Now, it turns out that she was on a full-ride scholarship for a medical degree. She wanted to be a doctor. She had to maintain straight A's to keep her scholarship. And I said, well, I don't think it's very fair of you. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, there are people who have to work and go to school. They don't have the luxury of just sitting and studying like you do because someone gave you money. You should give up some of your A's for their C's, and you should both get B's. She says, I'm not going to do that. I said, why not? Because I wouldn't get my scholarship anymore. Yeah, but it's not fair that you're not working, and they have to. You should work as well. No, I have my scholarship. I get the, the chance to study, and I get my grades. She could not understand the connection. Yeah, there's other people who they worked really hard and produced products that sold, and they make money off the things they sold. They should be allowed to keep their money too. Like you get to keep your A's. She couldn't see it. Just couldn't see it. 